started on off here with, uh, I guess, the unique things that there are in stainless steel. We're all pretty much aware at this point of hexavalent chromium. Uh, hexavalent chromium, the input or the throughput of the energy through the stainless steel kicks it up to CR6. There's a period of time where we derate, when we come off of CR6 and we drop on down to CR3 or CR2. Uh, that can have an impact on people who are on out there gathering this material on up and then if you send it out to CR6, it's hazardous waste, yet if you can wait to derate to CR3, it'll have a more beneficial effect, I guess, on your bottom line. Um, we'll talk about quite a few things here. I've thrown some slides together and then we'll get into some stuff that from our company's perspective is proprietary, but I can talk about it and throw it onto a slide. What is plasma? Plasma is often referred to as the fourth state of matter. Plasma, like other three states of liquid or solid liquid and gas, has its own unique properties. Just as most substrates will become solid if cooled enough, any substance can become plasma if heated enough. Uh, in the plasma, the electrons are stripped from the atoms, creating a substance that resembles a gas, but that uh, conducts electricity. Natural forms of plasma here, flames, electrical discharges, lightning bolts, aurora borealis, and northern lights. Uh, this is the downside of plasma, I would assume here. Uh, there's an awful lot of things in play when you're cutting. You see the smokes, you see the fume. Uh, what's in that smoke or fume can be hazardous or, or may not be hazardous. One of the big things that you see right there right now is probably about a million sparks. If you're going to run dust collection, you have to address the spark. I would address the spark before I would consider, consider anything on else. Dust collectors operate at three continuous points. Air draw, some sort of a filter element, and that heated spark. If you remove any one of the three, a dust collector will not have a fire. If we remove the spark, we've essentially removed the fume and now we're not a dust collector. If we don't have fan movement, we're not putting fume into a dust collector. The only thing that you can address is the spark to operate safely. If you can't address it, your dust collector is going to turn into a hibachi, you're going to stop production on your floor, and you clearly cross the line at this point. Pretty much nothing worse than anybody's facility than having a piece of equipment that bursts into flames, starts to fill the facility on up with some sort of black smoke or whatever the color smoke on it. 99% of the people will run towards the door, the other 1% are the heroes and they run right towards something. You do not want an employee going towards a dust collector that is on fire. The quantity of fumes. The amount of fumes and gases in plasma cutting operations depends on the cutting speed, plate thickness, alloy content, design of the cutting table, power supply, and the ventilation conditions. If you want to break it down, it's curve times metal thickness times inches of uh, cut, which converts to a generated amount of material. Everybody, or there's been an awful lot of guys up here that have been talking about uh, wire. We know that solid core wire, one to two percent, converts to a collectible material. Uh, stainless converts, aluminum converts at a little bit bigger number. There's nothing in your plant that's going to make more pollution than that cutting table. You can weld all day and have a minor amount of fumes. You can cut on one plate inside of your facility and you'll have it in just a completely unacceptable environment. To take a look at some of this emissions of uh, fumes and plant cutting of mild stainless steel. Material thickness of only 8 millimeter at 3.5 meters per minute cut. We're looking at 20 to 26 grams per minute of fume production. To get 20 to 26 minutes of fume production in a welding environment, you're going to be welding all day. Take a look at the stainless steel. Same scenario, 30 to 34. When you get to a thicker stainless steel, 35 millimeter on over there, you'll notice that the total weight of vaporized metal drops down dramatically, and that strictly has to do with the fact that your cut speed drops down dramatically. The components of fumes in mild steel, uh, metal oxide, 67 to 73%, 2% to 10% manganese. Manganese is kind of one of those hot words that's in our industry. There have been some lawsuits in the industry. There's been a recent uh, settling of manganese lawsuits, and now there is a general fund put together. If you take a look at the, man or the stainless steel in the bottom, your metal contents of stainless steel vary. 38 to 44% chromium, 12 to 20% nickel. These are large, large percentages. Uh, if you have an operator standing next to a plasma cutting machine and there is fume that's coming towards that operator, you are going to be hot on the OSHA PEL. Uh, your other ones that are on in there, manganese 4 to 10%, copper 2 to 6 and on up. 
the emissions of the fumes is expressed by the total amount of removal uh, from cutting. You'll notice that although we're taking a big shot on out of that metal, really in the mild steel at 8 mil, only 5% of that kerf and that metal that you've removed converts to a respirable fume. Stainless steel, 7%, and then on the larger, because your slower cut rates are down at about 1% again. Uh, the kerf that you're looking at there, if you wanted to convert it on 8 millimeter plate, 2 to, millimeter, uh, 2 to 3 millimeters, on your 35 millimeter plate, 3 to 4 millimeters. So if you add that on up, um, it's significant. You have an awful lot of cuts that occur in a plate that add that metal up endlessly as you're tracing it around with the uh, plate itself. It becomes a big number very, very fast. And you have to address it as such through a dust collector. 95% um, of that material off of that mild is going to end up in that, uh, in that collector. Or excuse me, 95% of it remains in the, the uh, table itself. 5% becomes a respirable fume. This is pretty typical of what you look at. This is an individual who's very hard to uh, protect the guy. He's standing there in a cloud. And the thing that I really like about this photograph is the man fan that sits in the background. Oh. Right? And there's an awful lot of facilities that are like that. If you go back to the previous photograph that we had with the robot that was on in there, um, which environment would you rather be in? What we have here now is uh, there's an awful lot of individuals on out there who've made a capital investment. They bought the dust collection, they have the table. Now they want to step up to a little bit bigger metal processing. So what they do is they run on out, they buy a little bit larger power supplies. Power supplies, when I came back in in 1995 into this industry, were not 600 amp power supplies. We have power supplies now that are capable of cutting six inch steel that are on out there. Take that curve times six inches of metal and vaporize that metal and put it into a dust collector. Your static pressure that you're putting on and the material that you're putting on in are dramatic. There are also points here where we have customers that are paralleling power supplies. We do one of the largest operations uh, in North America. One of our companies is 300 gallons of uh, collectible material in two months, all on stainless steel. 300 gallons of particulate is an enormous amount. We have customers that are generating 110 gallons, 255 gallon drums of material in one shift. These power supplies are offering you the ability to do so much more, as it states in the bottom. Higher amperage equals higher or faster cut speeds and the ability to cut thicker metals. This ultimately results in greater fume production. If you're going to upgrade your power supply, you almost automatically have to upgrade, upgrade the uh, dust collector at the same point. If you're not, then what you're going to find is this material is going to come on out from underneath the plate. It's just not going to be able to capture enough of it. And you've got an operator that is standing right next to the table who's in this breathing environment. More of these modern table technologies. Advanced drive packages. These gantries are moving much faster than they did in the old days. If the gantry moves faster and you put a bigger power supply on top of this thing, then you can cut a lot faster. Multiple torch head configurations. You can put two torch heads on a, on a gantry, no problem. Three we've seen on out there on an individual gantry. Overall table lengths are getting longer. If you are going to go past a certain point, you almost have to capture the fume from both ends of the table. You will not be able to maintain the static pressure to pull the fume long enough through it. So now you've got to tap on both ends of the table here in order to help this thing on out. Multiple gantries. We have one cutting table in the Midwest that's 300 feet long. We've got five gantries on that table. Five gantries, two torches, ten active torches going into this collection. That's the amount of fumes where you're coming up with 110 gallons of particulate. Add to this the advancement of robotics. We're seeing an awful lot of robotics and we're not cutting on a, on a two axis plane any longer. We have got all of them that are involved. We're not blowing the fumes straight down, we're blowing it sideways. We're cutting in all kinds of different directions. How do you overcome uh, the power, I guess, of the force of that plasma arc through a piece of metal sideways when you're trying to pull it on down? It really causes you to take a step back, take a look at it from an engineering standpoint, try to figure out what you're going to do to be successful in capturing all of this. If you're on hexavalent chromium, in our industry, 70% effectiveness still means that your employee is incredibly hot on hex chrome. You have to get all of the fuel. Sizing of down uh, draft uh, table for dust collection. From a costing perspective, 
if you're going on out there and you're looking to pick up a, a plasma cutting table. Zone size. First off, is it zoned? If it's not, if you have a table that's five feet wide and it's 10 feet long and there's no zones, then you have to do the calculations and you have to come up with the number. The number that sits right there is width times length times 200 feet per minute downdraft. So three foot zone by 10 foot wide at 200 feet per minute downdraft is a 6,000 CFM dust collector. If you're five by 10, you're going into a much larger dust collector and oftentimes the dust collector cost is going to be equal or greater than the cost of the capital piece of equipment. Very few people are going to make that investment. The smaller the zone, the smaller the dust collector I have to put on. In this application at 6,000, if I convert that on down to a two foot zone by 10 feet, now I'm 2,000, uh, or excuse me, uh, I'm gonna be 4,000 CFM, off the calculations. 4,000 CFM dust collector is going to be less expensive than a 6,000 as it goes on. How do I know if my employee is protected? This ultimately becomes the big question here. Um, do the testing, plain and simple. Sample the air near the breathing zone of the operator. They're gonna come on in, they're gonna put a lapel tester on them. It's gonna sit right here. It is the closest thing to the breathing zone that he's gonna come up with. You do the testing. Um, as it states here, oftentimes your insurance company can assist you with this as they have a vested interest in your operating your facility safely. Uh, third party inspection firms are an option as well. AIHA, sorry, yeah. Um, third party firms, AIHA, American Industrial Hygienists Association. If whatever state you're in, if you go on to AIHA, they will have a list of people that are located in your area. They will come on in and do it. Oftentimes we're asked to do it. It sets up a conflict of interest. You probably don't want to do it so much yourself. You want somebody else to stand there and say, where are we at? Um, once the testing and analysis of the samples are completed, the areas of concern can be identified. From here, discussions of remedying the situation can begin. There's only so much oftentimes I can do with the dust collector. Um, there are times where you have to take a look at that application and you have to say, you know what, the table is just not sufficient. We have an awful lot of agreements with OEMs on out there and we work at making their tables better. Plasma cutting table manufacturers are not so much concerned about the ventilation side of things. You have to equalize the amount of air that you're putting on into it. If the plasma cutting table is asking for 3,000 CFM, you have to make sure that you can get the 3,000 CFM to the table. You have to equalize the amount of area and space that are on the ports inside of the table to the duct that's on out. If you don't, you front load static pressure. I will use an analogy of a shop vac because it's the easiest thing for a lot of us to understand. If you turn a shop vac on and you take the hose and you put your hand over the hose, the motor goes to freeze because it can't get the air on into it. The same exact thing happens in a dust table. If I can't get the air on into it, my motor goes into a higher state. I'm using more energy to try to process the metal. On the back side of it, oftentimes people will want to put HEPA filters on the back end of a dust collector if you're processing on stainless steel. If you're not putting the proper amount of HEPA filters on the back end, you might as well go to the shop back and I'll put your hand over the discharge port. Front load and static pressure is equal to back load and static pressure. If you can't get air out, you can't get air in. If you can't get air in, it's not going to process air out. Any questions? This one's kind of critical. It's a big reason why an awful lot of folks on out there go through filters in a very short period of time. The filters really aren't burnt on up. What actually has happened is you've eclipsed the blower curve and the unit is now going to peel on down and you're going to derate. If you're asking for 3,000 CFM and you have a massive problem with internal static pressure within your table, you may only be delivering 2,700. Two conditions in state in our industry at all points in time. Airflow static pressure. As the filters get dirtier, your CFM decreases. If you artificially manipulate the static pressure and put it into an elevated state, your clean filters are now running down here where you anticipated them to be up here. There's an awful lot of reasons why things fail in our industry. Understanding it puts you a little bit ahead of the curve.